Nice, that's a good sound. We haven't had that sound for a long time. <laughs> so thanks everyone for joining us today for Gammon's thesis defense. It's the first in-person defense we've had in two years since the pandemic, so this is really exciting to see everyone here. So we have a lot of people uh, in person and then there's also people joining us, I think, over Zoom. And so I'll do a little bit of an introduction to Gammon. Gammon will do his uh, thesis defense. Then after that, we'll have time for questions. We can take questions from the audience. And from people that are watching over Zoom, we think the best thing to do would be to type your questions into the chat. And then either Gammon or I will read those questions out loud and give him a chance to answer them. After everyone's had a chance to answer some questions, then we'll take a bit of a break and Gammon's thesis committee, which include me, Scott Hamilton, Amanda Kahn, and then Jenny Dugan, who's visiting us uh, virtually from UC Santa Barbara. We'll take Gammon into the other room, we'll chat with him for just a little bit longer, then bring him back out and there'll be some food and drinks and celebration. And, uh, and we'll have a great time. <laughs> All right, so with that, I was just gonna do a brief little introduction to tell you about Gammon. So Gammon, I guess I gotta take this thing. Right, Gammon was, yeah, there's a lot of evidence. He was born, I think, to be a marine scientist. But from a very young age, he was a pretty capable waterman, building amazing sandcastles, scuba diving at the age of 10. I mean, look at him. He just is out of diapers, and then he's straight into, into diving. <laughs> Piloting sailboats, surfing, paddle craft, all sorts of stuff. There's also evidence he's pretty capable around various frozen liquids. <laughs> Skiing, and man, you know your way around an ice cream cone. That looks, I'm, I'm hungry right now. Right, Gammon uh, completed his, his BS degree at the University of Miami, so he was in Florida, and he had a, a lot of different research experiences uh, before he came here. So he worked on a coral restoration project as part of one of the benthic ecology and conservation labs there. So there you can see him scuba diving, uh, working on restoring uh, Acropora staghorn corals. Even I'll show you a bit later, he, he has a publication where he's the first author as an undergrad from that, from that project. He also worked with the Shark Research and Conservation Group, and you can see him there tagging, was it a sandbar shark, something like that? And he, he developed some skills there doing GIS and as well studying sort of the, the spatial ecology and the movement patterns of a number of shark species. Gammon is also quite skilled at wrangling all sorts of wildlife, which came in very handy for the project that he worked on here at Moss Landing. So he, you can see he can catch fish, big fish, you can catch little fish, <laughs> birds, baby sharks. We can wrangle donkeys, <laughs> alligators. I don't think that one's alive, but maybe. <laughs> and dogs and all sorts of things. Right at Moss Landing here, Gammon helped uh, me and then Lauren Parker, who's in the middle lower photo, to, to lead the surf zone. Marine Protected Area Monitoring Program. And one of Gammon's uh, committee members, Jenny Dugan, is the lead uh, investigator of this for the statewide program for monitoring the surf zones. Uh, our team is involved in monitoring the fish assemblages at eight sites three times a year. And Gammon came on the summer before he started at Moss Landing and helped to take over the program. I was having some weird, mysterious health things that I couldn't really be involved in. Basically, Gammon and Lauren just, they did it all. We do beach scenes, as you can see up top. We do, as Gammon will tell you about in his, his presentation, these surf zone video cameras, lots of other data collection. And really, just my hat goes off to Gammon. I can't thank you enough for everything you did to keep this program running. I came back the second summer, they didn't even need me. I was worthless at that point, because they could do it all. And Gammon, he's just he's really smart, really well organized, learns quickly, you know, was great in the field, really good leading and supervising the other members of the team, training new people that came out. He's incredibly patient and just has this demeanor. He's always happy, smiling. I've, I've tr tried to provoke him. There's no anger. <laughs> this man is not possible of anger. You can see there just big smiles all around. He worked really hard uh, for this project and for his thesis. You know, occasionally he did sleep. I didn't know if he did, but there's some evidence. A couple of times. <laughs> Sometimes he's got to work on that great tan though too. You know? <laughs> Gammon loves nature, right? traveling, especially with his family. 
He's always got a camera around his neck. He's a really accomplished photographer as well. Right. On the academic side, he's, again, quite accomplished at this stage. He's three publications, so he was a co-author on the huge report that we submitted uh, to the Sea Grant and Ocean Protection Council describing changes in the MPAs in the surf zone. Along with Rachel Aitchison at Moss Landing, they, using some of the video footage, found some, a new observation, a range extension of the banded guitar fish, and took it upon themselves to write a paper describing it. And then as well on the bottom there, see Gammon was, again, the lead author from research he did as an undergrad, coral restoration techniques. Some other highlights, he was really good at getting funding. So he wrote a, wrote a lot of different grant proposals. Uh, he got the 2020 Moss Landing Wave Award. He got a CSU Coast Graduate Research Award. Moss Landing Student Body Scholarship. This other award from Coast with his joint program at UC Davis that was about uh, translating your, your science for policymakers, as well as the Robert Weigel Scholarship for Coastal Studies. While he was taking his classes and running the Surfstone Project, he also had other forms of employment. So he, he was a GIS intern for city government in Monterey. Most, more recently, he took a job as a scientific aide with the California Fish and Wildlife, again, doing GIS and spatial analysis of recreational fishing data. He was also volunteering at the Monterey Aquarium as a diver in many of their exhibits. And there's a picture of him with his, with his grandparents uh, who are with us today. So with that, Gammon, congratulations. Right? We'll miss you, there's him diving in the aquarium. He's graduating in under three years, which I think is just amazing. <laughs> Especially given all the challenges of the pandemic. You know, most people were delayed, but somehow he got accelerated. <laughs> and next steps, he had a number of job offers, but he decided to take one with the Fairlands Institute. And he's like, a little over a week, he's starting a new job. And so way to go, Gammon. We're really proud of you. And with that, you're up. Thank you, Scott. That was a really wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm so excited to see everyone that I've got to meet during my time at Moss Landing. And I'm very excited to share with you my thesis and all the research that I've done. Um, and also, before I get started, I just want to wish everyone a very happy Earth Day. This is very exciting, too. <laughs> um, so yeah, today I'm going to be sharing with you my results and my thesis on factors affecting the seasonal variation of surf zone assemblage in Central California. And so um, this will be a slightly longer talk. And because of that, uh, I have this outline that will kind of help you follow along. And so you'll see that at the top of each slide. And again, that's just kind of help you to help you follow along and uh, keep track of where we are in the presentation. Um, so starting first with the introduction, um, most importantly, what is the surf zone? And so uh, the surf zone is an area of the beach ecosystem, and it's traditionally defined as uh, the area from the outer line of breaking waves all the way up until where the waves reach on the shore. Um, and as you would kind of imagine, uh, this is a very high energy, turbulent, and chaotic environment. Um, it receives a lot of wave action that kind of stirs everything up, uh, huge changes in tides throughout the day, and it's just a very... Um, chaotic place to be. Uh, but because of that too, it's also a very important ecosystem for a lot of species. Um, many juvenile fish use the surf zone as a shelter area to hide from predators in the shallow waters. Um, it's a very important feeding grounds for many species of uh, birds, marine mammals, and other larger fish. Um, and then it also provides access from the ocean to beaches. And um, beaches are a very important feeding or uh, breeding ground for species like the California grunion or the elephant seal. Uh, so in addition to being an important ecosystem for many species, beaches and the surf zone are also very important to people. Um, as we know, coastal development, so building houses, hotels, all of that on the beach is very, very highly sought after real estate. Everyone dreams of retiring on the beach. Um, and because of that, that leads to a lot of development on the beach. Um, shore fishing, so fishing in the surf zone, is also a very common practice globally. 
Uh, here in California, we experience more of a recreational shore fishing, but in other places in the world, it's pretty common for subsistence fishing. Um, but then in addition to our uses of the coast, the coast is also important to us because beaches um, provide, add in some additional coastal resilience. So um, here in Monterey, we have those really big dunes and those can help harbor the, and protect the shore from um, big waves and storms and all of that. Um, so in addition to being used by people, it's also, the surf zone is a very susceptible environment. So specifically to factors like climate change, so things like sea level rise and urban runoff, so um, the runoff of pollution and nutrients from urban areas, those can have some pretty negative effects on the surf zone. Um, and then that can also kind of lead to this phenomenon called coastal squeeze. Um, and so coastal squeeze is, if you look at this top picture here, um, this is just kind of a natural beach, um, just stereotypical beach with the, the waves and the water and the sand and the grass. Um, and so then in this ecosystem, as uh, the sea level begins to rise, um, the beach community just migrates further up the beach and everything is um, still in a pretty good harmony there. Um, however, when we add in the influence of human factors, um, so like for example, this seawall here to protect uh, coastal development or something like that, um, then as the sea level begins to rise, um, the beach migration of the ecosystem is halted because it can't get around that structure. So um, that phenomenon where we add in the human factors is coastal squeeze. And here's an example of it in uh, Monterey. This is a picture from Stillwater Cove. And so here you can see, uh, here you can see some coastal armoring. Um, this is protecting the 17th green at Pebble Beach, which is a very famous golf course. So um, people are very keen on protecting things from the, the ocean. Um, and so because it's such a susceptible environment, um, it does receive some forms of conservation. And so typically this is in the form of marine protected areas or MPAs. Um, and so MPAs are just kind of an area designated to help minimize the effect, the effect of humans and the anthropogenic stressors that we can cause on the environment. And uh, here in California, we have a very extensive network of MPAs throughout the whole state. Um, and they all vary in kind of their degree of protection, but uh, the two types that I'm gonna be talking about a little later in my presentation are uh, the state marine reserves uh, or SMRs. And so these are a type of no-take MPA, which means no harvesting, no fishing, um, everything is as it is. Uh, and then state marine conservation areas, which can kind of range in their, uh, their protection efforts, but generally do allow some take and some harvest. Um, and so here in California, we have um, the surf perch family. And so these, uh, this family of perch is, as the name suggests, they live in the surf zone. Um, and they're also really important predators for the surf zone. Some of the larger species like you see here um, feed on the sand crabs and other invertebrates that live in the surf zone. And they're a pretty important predator there. Um, but because they're also some of the larger species that reside in the surf zone, they're also the most commonly targeted uh, fish here in California. And I do also just want to point out that all of these very beautiful illustrations of fish that you'll see throughout my entire talk uh, were drawn by Larry Allen. So those are very nice. <laughs> um, and so like many other ecosystems on the planet, the surf zone receives changes in seasons. And um, here in Central California, these seasons are predominantly driven by uh, changes in the oceanographic conditions. Um, so the summer in the surf zone is typically from like June to August. Um, and during that time, there's a lot less waves. Uh, the water temperatures are beginning to increase a little bit. Uh, then as we move into the fall, so September to November, um, that's when the water temperatures hit their warmest here. Um, the image here is some satellite data showing sea surface temperature. And then the figure on the right is a close up of Monterey Bay. And you can see uh, some of those temperatures are even getting up into like 17 degrees Celsius, which is about 62 degrees Fahrenheit. And while that might not seem very warm, that is pretty warm for this area. Um, so then in the fall, when the waters get the warmest, uh, then we move into the winter. And so winter is uh, when we start to get a lot of storms here. 
and those storms can lead to bigger waves, um, like these nice sized waves that I saw at Moss Landing State Beach a few years ago. Um, but then those additional waves also uproot a lot of kelp. And the kelp then is transported through the surf zone and onto shore. Um, and kelp is a very important subsidy for the surf zone. Um, because it's a turbulent, in, turbulent environment, it's not really possible for many plant species or primary producers to, to set down their holdfasts and start to grow here. Um, so all the nutrients that would typically be supplied through the primary producers are instead supplied through the kelp that drifts through shore. Um, and in addition to the nutrients, the kelp also brings um, invertebrates that species like the surf perch feed on and can also provide shelter for uh, smaller fish to hide in. Um, and then moving into our last season, uh, the spring, so from March to May, um, that's when we start to receive strong winds that can cause upwelling. Um, and then that brings lots of cold, nutrient-rich water to the surface and integrates that into the mix. And so again, here we see some sea surface temperature from 1995. Um, and you can see that big, uh, big plume of purple and blue water here that kind of um, represents water that's about 9 to 10 degrees Celsius. Um, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit and very, very cold. Um, so additionally, um, the surf zone is a pretty underrepresented ecosystem within the scientific literature. Um, this study done by Olds et al. 2018 uh, looked at all, a bunch of previous studies that uh, occurred in the surf zone in scientific journals. Um, and in total, they found about 152 of them. Um, and you might notice here that only uh, four of them actually took place on the west coast of the United States. So uh, we don't really know a whole lot about the surf zone here in California. Um, and so because of that, it's a really important ecosystem to study. Uh, since that 2018 review, we have done some additional research. As Scott mentioned, we're doing the uh, statewide assessment of marine protected areas on the surf zone. Um, so it is an actively studied community. Um, but because of this, I did choose to focus my thesis on the surf zone. And so, moving into my objectives now. Um, my thesis had three main areas that I wanted to focus on. And so the first was looking at the seasonal changes in the surf zone. Um, the second was looking at the effects of marine protected areas. And the third was looking at the environmental factors affecting the community. And so these three symbols um, are going to coincide with each of their, uh, the topic that, they, that they're with here. And so I also have some of these symbols on the slides to, again, just kind of help you follow along and stay where we are in the talk. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that for my full thesis, I looked at um, a bunch of different factors, including uh, diversity, richness, abundance, and then shifts in assemblage. Um, however, for this presentation, I'm just going to be focusing on diversity and assemblage, because otherwise we'd be here for a lot longer. Um, so my first question was looking at how the assemblage changes seasonally. And so I predicted that, again, in the winter when there's a lot of waves, um, I predicted that diversity would be lowest, um, so there'd be the fewest species present, and then assemblage would kind of shift towards not having a lot of species or abundances uh, in the surf zone. Um, then as we move into spring, when we start to get more winds, but that triggers the upwelling, which brings more nutrients, um, I predicted that that's probably about when diversity would peak. Uh, because those nutrients would kind of bring in a lot more unique species into the area. Um, and then assemblage would again shift to, to having more species present. Then as we move into the summer, uh, when there's less waves, this is when I predicted that um, assemblage would shift to have greater abundances of species as um, the, condition, the environment becomes more habitable and uh, more species would kind of be present within the surf. Um, and then again, as we move into the fall with the warmer temperatures, that's kind of, I figured everything would about settle out then um, before reverting back to the winter when everything would migrate out of the surf zone. And so my second question, uh, looking at how the assemblage changed between no-take MPAs and reference sites throughout the year. Um, so again, I, looking at these uh, no-take MPAs or SMRs, um, I predicted that the communities would be different between them and that there would be both a greater diversity and abundance of species within the MPAs because having 
uh, that minimization of the human impact and the no fishing would be a benefit to the surf zone community. And then my third question looked at if there are specific environmental factors that are causing these differences in assemblage. And so in total, I looked at eight different factors. Um, the six that are in the table on the left in green, um, I figured would, I predicted would have a positive association with, um, with the species. And so uh, what that means is that if the greater the environmental effect, the greater number of species, the greater number of individuals there would be. Um, so for example, for water temperature, if there's warmer waters, then there would be more species present. Or for algae, if there's, greater number, if there's a greater percent cover of algae, then that would result in more species. Um, and then the two variables on the, in the table on the right, or in orange, um, I predicted would have a negative association, so kind of the opposite. Um, the greater the effect of the environmental, the fewer species and fewer abundances would be present. Um, so factors like wind speed, so if there's more wind, um, that's creating more chop, more wind waves, um, and causing more turbulence, then there would be less species. And then same with bigger waves would mean less species. And so moving into the methods that I use to study the surf zone. Um, so to answer all of these questions, I selected four sites uh, around the Monterey Peninsula. And each of these sites was sampled uh, about once a month from July of 2020 to June of 2021. And uh, of those four sites, two of them were within those no-take MPAs or SMRs. And then two of them were selected as reference sites. So each MPA had a specific reference site associated with it. And those were matched up to have a similar uh, geophysical profile. Um, so for example, two of them were exposed sandy beaches and two of them were protected coves. Um, and so my first site pair was um, Spanish Bay and then Carmel Beach. And so Spanish Bay, the figure on the left, is uh, within the Asilomar State Marine Reserve, so no fishing at Spanish Bay. And then the reference site that I chose with that was Carmel. And so both of these sites are long, exposed, sandy beaches that receive a lot of waves. Um, and then my second site pair was Whaler's Cove and Stillwater Cove. And so Whaler's Cove is within the Point Lobos State Marine Reserve, and Stillwater Cove was selected as the reference. And as both of these names suggest, they're kind of more protected coves, so they don't receive quite a lot of wave action. And actually, both of these sites kind of harbor um, some kelp forests. You can kind of see some kelp through here and down here, and then it's same with uh, over here at Stillwater. Um, so in the end, I ended up sampling each site 11 times throughout the course of the year. Um, and you might notice that there were a few gaps, particularly in September and October for each of those sites. Um, and if you recall, that was mainly due to the uh, Carmel and River fires that we were experiencing in Monterey. Uh, unfortunately, those fires, while they didn't get close to the coastline, they did uh, make the air quality very unhealthy to be outside and particularly performing physical labor. Um, so the method that I chose to, to answer these questions, again, was through using um, baited remote underwater video stations, or BRUVs. Um, so the BRUVs that I used in this study were specifically designed to sample the surf. And so each BRUV consisted of a, a 10 pound plated weight, like the circular ones you'd find at the gym. And then on top of that was situated a GoPro um, with a bait bag that was one meter uh, extended in front of the camera. And so each um, bruv received um, 500 grams of chopped market squid as the bait. And uh, again, these were specifically designed to sample in the surf because they have a lower um, vertical profile here. So they're much more horizontal than vertical. And because they were in the waves and constantly being rolled over by waves, um, we needed something that sat flat on the ground so it wouldn't be knocked over by a wave. Uh, and at each site during the sa each sampling, uh, I deployed six brubs, and then they were left to record an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes of video uh, before being retrieved again. And I did constrain sampling to be within three hours of low tide uh, to try to minimize the effect of tide on the species present. And so here's just another example of the sampling. And so this is a, an aerial shot of Carmel Beach. Um, and so 
just as an example, I have three brubs here, and so each brub was deployed uh, behind this line of breaking waves here, and so um, that was chosen so it would still be in the surf, but just not constantly being pummeled by waves. Um, and then the brubs were spaced 50 meters apart along the beach, and this was uh, to try to minimize the effect of one individual uh, being caught on multiple brubs. And each brub was deployed to a depth of between five to six feet or about two meters. And so as you can imagine, uh, swimming with a 10 pound weight and a one foot pull was um, quite a unique experience in the waves. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but then while each brub was recording its video, uh, I also took a series of environmental measurements. And so these included uh, water temperature, wind speed, and salinity. And each of these was just measured with a, a handheld instrument in the, um, to get the measurements in the surf. And additionally, I also measured wave height using a wave pull and then the wave period by counting the time from crest to crest of a wave. And so this was all great because now I had a bunch of video, but I still didn't have really that much data. So the next step in the process was to actually watch the video and extract the data. Um, so this screen was one that I became very familiar with over the course of a year and a half or so. Um, and so this is a screenshot from the event measure program, um, which is what I use to watch all of the video and extract the data. Um, so this is a program specifically designed for watching uh, scientific videos. And for each brub, I would start the extraction process of watching the video about 10 minutes after the brub was deployed. And so this was to kind of let the ecosystem resume its natural state and uh, let the presence of people and people deploying weights on the ground um, minimize and make sure that wasn't going to be a factor. Uh, so after the 10 minutes, I would start the extraction video and then uh, analyze one hour of video for each brub. Um, and while I was watching that hour, I would go through and for every species that appeared, I would um, identify and count the numbers and then uh, continue on. And so I quantified all species, not just fish, but invertebrates, birds, and mammals too. Um, and so sometimes it would be nice and easy, like in this top picture where we have this rainbow sur or striped surf perch just hanging out by the camera and it would be a really easy identification. Uh, and then other times, like this bottom picture, I get a bird and I'm not a bird person, so I'd have to go text all my friends who were ornithologists and try to help me figure out what it was. Um, if you're curious, I'm pretty sure that was a, a red-throated loon. Um, and again, sometimes the conditions for the video would be nice and beautiful. You'd be able to see a lot happening in the background um, so like in this video, there's a school of top smelt swimming over here, you can kind of see. Um, and then there's also a little flatfish friend swimming down here. So yeah, sometimes the brubs were nice and beautiful and it was a lot of fun to watch. And then other times it would be watching <laughs> the camera be sandblasted for an hour. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of differences between uh, samplings throughout the year between sites. Uh, the conditions varied pretty wildly on the videos. Um, but another reason I chose to use the event measure program was that it calculates this metric called the max n. And so this is a really important metric for uh, brubs specifically in video um, for science. And um, max n represents the maximum number of individuals from the same species in a single frame of video. And so for video, this is kind of used as a, a proxy for abundance um, because um, the max n lets you guaranteed say you know how many individuals of one species are present um, and it prevents you from over inflating your estimates um, if there's just one individual that's constantly coming in and out of frame. And so you'd just be counting the same individual again and again 
because it's video, you can't confirm or deny whether or not it is in fact the same individual. Um, so MaxN um, is used for abundance in video and it is a more conservative metric because you are only saying you know that there's at least this amount but not there's actually this amount. Um, but that's an important one for video. And so just to kind of help you um, figure that out too, uh, I have a little example here. And so um, these two fish up top, these are kelp perch. And so because there's two of them in this frame of video, their max n would be two. Um, and then uh, this big old cabazon sitting on the bait bag, um, that is the only cabazon, so it would have a max n of one. And so each species gets its own max n value for the entire video. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, algae is a really important nutritional subsidy for the surf zone. And because of that, I also chose to quantify the amount of algae that I was seeing in the surf. And to do that, uh, I selected three images from the BRUV. Um, so one uh, at the zero minute or when I started the extraction process, so kind of the 10 minute. Um, and then again, halfway through the hour and at the full hour. And for each image, I overlaid a grid of 24 random points in the ImageJ software, which is uh, represented in the bottom picture there. And then identified the type of algae that was below each point. Um, so I just did broad classifications of algae. So uh, brown, green, red, and seagrass. Um, and then using those points, I was able to calculate a percent cover for each BRUV for each of those classifications. And then uh, lastly, this data was factored into my analyses for the environmental factors, so for that third question. And so this was great. I was slowly moving through the process. I finally had data. So the last few steps were to get the data prepared. Um, and again, so I had a max n value for each species for all the brubs. And then using those max n values, I calculated the Shannon Wiener diversity index. Um, and then for each BRUV, I averaged all six BRUVs for one sampling day to get basically one diversity of value and then uh, one diversity value and then one max n value for each species for, for one sampling day. Um, and then from there, those each sampling day point was joined with the respective environmental variables from that day too. And then to run the statistics and determine significance and any trends, um, I kind of did different analyses for each question. Uh, so the first question, looking at the seasonal differences um, for diversity, I just ran a two-way analysis of variance or ANOVA. And then for that, I used uh, site and season as my factors. Um, and then to look at assemblage, I chose to use a multivariate approach. And for that, I used a non-metric multidimensional scaling analysis or NMDS. Um, which is an ordination technique that lets you view the multivariate data. And then to determine significance of that, I used a two-way permutational evaluate analysis of variance or permanova. And again, the two factors for the permanova were site and season. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that for the assemblage data, it was all square root transformed. And so that downweights the importance of overly abundant species. Um, and then for my second question on the effects of MPAs, I did a pretty similar analysis as the first one, uh, two-way ANOVA for diversity, although this time the two factors were MPA status instead of site, and then uh, season. And for the assemblage data, um, again, I ran an NMDS to view the data, and then just did a permanova on the effect of MPA status. And then my last question on the environmental drivers. Um, for this, I chose to run a distance-based redundancy analysis, or DBRDA. And this takes a series of uh, explanatory variables. So in my case, it was the environmental data, and then tries to relate that to a list of um, response variables, or in my case, the uh, species data. And so it tries to look at the relationships between those and kind of helps you tease out some of those trends. All right, now let's look at some results. So uh, in total for my thesis, I watched 264 brubs or 264 hours of video. Um, and then on 
52 of those brubs. Uh, I did not record any individuals, so no species were present on those brubs. Um, and that, that rounded out to be a little less than 20%. Um, but overall, I did uh, identify 50 unique species. And so uh, you can see here, it was mainly fish with quite a few invertebrates. Um, but then the occasional marine mammal or bird would pop in there too. Um, and because it was mainly just fish and invertebrates, um, I chose to constrain my analysis to just those two classifications. Um, and each of them was analyzed uh, individually. So looking at the results from my first question on the seasonality, uh, starting first with the diversity of fish, um, I did find that the site was a significant factor for fish diversity. And so um, to interpret this plot here, uh, this is showing the Shannon Wiener diversity on the Y axis, and then each season on the X axis, and each column represents a different site. Um, and so the bars within each column are the the diversity values for each season, and the error bars here represent standard error. Um, and so site was a significant factor. So Whaler's Cove and Stillwater Cove, the two columns on the right side of the graph, um, were uh, significantly greater, had significantly more diversity than Spanish Bay and Carmel Beach. Um, there was no effect of season on the fish diversity. Um, but there was a significant interaction factor between the sites and seasons. And this was a pretty messy one, but overall it was kind of uh, at Whaler's Cove and Stillwater Cove, there was more diversity in the spring and summer than the winter and fall. Um, so moving to the assemblage data for the fish, um, these two figures represent the results from the non-metric multidimensional scaling. And so the data on both figures is the same. The point values are the same on both figures. Uh, the figure on the left is just colored by season, and the figure on the right is colored by site. Um, and then both figures have the species vectors for the fish species overlaid on top. And so to interpret that, we'll walk through it a little bit, uh, a little bit more in a second. But to interpret it, the direction of the species arrow with the ellipses uh, indicates a positive relationship, and then the length of the arrow indicates the strength of the, the relationship. Um, so from my Permanova, I did find that both site and season were significant factors for fish assemblage. And so if we look in the upper uh, left corner of both graphs here, um, you can see there's four species vectors listed there, the three species of surf perch and the leopard shark. And so to interpret that, you would just um, in the figure on the left, you can see that they're uh, in line with the purple and blue ellipses, which represent winter and spring. And then in the figure on the right, they're with the red and the green ellipses, which represent Spanish Bay and Carmel. So these four species of fish uh, were more common in the winter and spring and at Spanish Bay and Carmel. Um, and then if we look at the right-hand side of both figures, we'll see there's a lot more species. Um, and in the figure on the left, looking at the season, there's not really any major trends there. Um, but then in the figure on the right, there are quite a few. You can see that the separation of the Whaler's Cove and Stillwater Cove are the purple and blue ellipses there. And so these species were more common at both of those two sites. So moving to the diversity results for invertebrates now. Um, for diversity of invertebrates for season, there was a significant uh, difference. So there was a greater amount of diversity in the summer than there was in the winter. Um, and then there was also a significant um, effect of sight on the diversity of invertebrates. So uh, Spanish Bay and Carmel Beach had a significantly greater diversity than Whaler's Cove. Um, however, for invertebrates, the interaction of those two was not significant. And so looking at the assemblage results for invertebrates, um, again, these are the results from the NMDS and you interpret them in the same way. Uh, it's the same data on both graphs. It's just on the left, they're colored by season and on the right, they're colored by site. 
Um, and so for invertebrate assemblage, uh, there was significant differences by site, as you can see by kind of the, a lot of non-overlap in the cylinder, in the circles on the right figure. Um, but then there was not a significant difference for season. Um, so you see in the figure on the left that a lot of the ellipses are just overlapping each other and there wasn't really anything there. Um, but looking at the invertebrates, uh, so looking at the right hand side of the, each graph, um, mainly on the right graph, you can see that those, those circles for Whaler's Cove and Stillwater Cove, uh, so these four invertebrates were more common at those sites. Um, and I also wanna say that I cut out these images for all the invertebrates from uh, this Lamb and Hanby 2005 Pacific Marine Life Guide, which was a really cool book too. Um, and then looking at the uh, left-hand side of both figures, um, these two invertebrates, the sand crab and the purple dwarf olive snail, uh, represent the invertebrates that were more common at Carmel Beach and Spanish Bay. Um, so moving now to my second question, looking at the effect of MPA status. Um, again, starting first with the diversity of fish. Uh, for this, I didn't, um, I guess here to interpret this graph, again, it's diversity on the y-axis and um, the season is on the x and each uh, season has two bars. The red one or the one on the left in each group is the MPA sites and the one on the right or the blue bar is the reference sites. Um, and for these, uh, I did not detect any differences by season or MPA status for fish diversity. Um, if we look at assemblage though, there was a significant difference in MPA status for fish assemblage, which is really cool. Um, so again, this is a result from the NMDS. And so uh, these species on the right-hand side of the graph uh, associated more strongly with MPAs or the marine protected areas. Um, so it was quite a few species of surf perch and two species of rockfish along with the cabazon and senoritas. Um, and then some of these species kind of in the top left and bottom left, uh, those were the ones that associated more strongly with reference sites. Um, so things like the thornback ray, uh, guitar grass rockfish, and then barred and uh, walleye surf perch. So moving now to the invertebrate data, again, starting with diversity. Um, for invertebrates, I didn't detect any differences uh, between diversity for season or MPA status. Um, and um, the same was true for the assemblage data for invertebrates. Um, there was not a significant effect of MPA status uh, on the invertebrate species. And now moving to my final question on the environmental factors. Um, so here I just have some of the, the different factors summarized. And so these were kind of the ones that changed more seasonally. Um, so each graph represents a different variable and each bar represents a different season. Uh, so on the top left is wind average and you can see that that was highest in the spring, which coincides with the upwelling that we experience here. Uh, wave height was highest in the winter, which coincides with those winter storms. Um, tide height was kind of all over the place. And while this was a factor that I kind of tried to keep consistent due to the, the semi-diurnal tides that we experience here and the difference in the tide strength, uh, that one was kind of harder to keep consistent throughout the year. Um, and then temperature was also lowest in the winter and the spring in the bottom right, um, which was kind of cool. That was a very cold year. It was nice and chilly. Um, but then some of the other factors didn't change seasonally. So factors like uh, the depth at which the brub was deployed and visibility didn't really change throughout the year, um, which was good. Those weren't supposed to change. Um, but then factors like salinity were kind of surprising in that they didn't, salinity didn't really change throughout the year. Um, and then wave period was a little lower in the summer, but was pretty consistent in the winter, spring, and fall. Um, so also I have the results from the algae extraction, um, looking at the videos. And so the figure on the left just shows the average percent cover of algae. And then the figure on the right shows the breakdown of the different classifications. And so there was more algae in the spring and summer than there was in the fall and winter. Um, and generally it was mainly composed of brown and red algae. Um, but interestingly enough that there was no green algae present in the winter on the brubs. And so green algae would represent species like ulva or sea lettuce. 
Um, so looking at the results from the distance-based redundancy analysis, um, again, starting with fish, um, for these, uh, the point data on both figures is the same. Uh, the figure on the left represents the environmental variables, and so all eight variables were run through the uh, analysis, but I only graphed the significant explanatory variables. Um, and then the figure on the right has the species vectors, and so to interpret these, one, these figures, you kind of mentally overlay the two images, and the direction of the environmental arrow, uh, if it coincides with the direction of the species vector, then those two had a positive relationship, or if they go opposite directions, then they had a negative relationship. Uh, and so the significant variables for fish were wave height was the largest one. As you can see, it has the longest arrow um, right here. Uh, but then depth, visibility, and water temperature were also significant. Um, so some of the species that uh, associated positively with wave height, so um, the species on the left here were more common on days with bigger waves. Um, so there were four species of surf perch and then the leopard shark. Um, and then, not too surprisingly, most species associated negatively with big wave days, um, which is kind of what you would expect. Um, but those were many of the smaller species of surf perch, uh, the rockfish, um, and then some species like Cabazon, Senorita, and Thornback Ray. Um, and then just the other factors for uh, the fish. So another one was water temperature. And so two species uh, associated positively with water temperature. So they were more present on warmer days. Um, so like the Thornback Ray and Dwarf Perch. Uh, while many, um, the species that associated negatively with water temperature were also the same ones that exposed that associated positively with wave height. Uh, so those four species of surf perch and the leopard shark. Um, and then the last one, visibility. Uh, the only species that associated positively with visibility was the speckled sand dab, um, which kind of makes sense as a very cryptic and hard to see species. Um, probably only could really see them on those really nice clear days. <laughs> um, but then interestingly, quite a few species associated negatively with uh, visibility too. So looking at the results uh, from the invertebrate uh, distance-based redundancy analysis, and I promise this is the last graph here. Um, <laughs> uh, again, you interpret it the same way. Um, the significant environmental variables are shown on the left, and so uh, for invertebrates, wave height and visibility were both significant again, um, although this time there was the percent cover of green algae and the percent cover of red algae too. Um, and so for wave height and visibility, uh, I grouped those together because the arrows were pretty close to each other. Um, and so sand crabs and the purple dwarf olive snail associated positively with these factors. So they were, uh, both these species were more common on days with bigger waves and better visibility. Um, and then species that associated negatively with those factors were the red rock crab and the sea gooseberry. Um, and interestingly, both those, the red rock crab and the sea gooseberry um, also associated positively with the uh, higher amount of green algae. Um, and then another really interesting trend was that uh, quite a few of the invertebrates associated negatively with the percent cover of red algae. Um, so they were more common on days with less red algae, uh, while nothing associated positively with that. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but that was a lot, so just kind of to summarize it and recap everything, uh, my first question on seasonality, um, site and season were influential factors for fish diversity and assemblage. Uh, season and site were influential for invertebrate diversity, while site was influential for invertebrate assemblage. Uh, my second question on the effect of MPAs, um, there was an effect of MPAs on fish, uh, however, there was no effect on invertebrates. And the last question on environmentals, um, wave height and visibility were uh, significant factors for both fish and invertebrates, um, and they were two of the more influential factors for both of them, too. So, the last section, my discussion. <laughs> um, you might have noticed that there were quite a few species that associated more with, um, with that winter and spring, so these three species of surf perch and then the leopard shark. Um, interestingly, this 
the only brav that I ever recorded more than one leopard shark at once was from January of 2020, which was really cool. Normally it was just one individual that would hang out for a little bit and then leave. Um, but I think that the high abundances of the surf perch species can be explained by their life history. Um, so for the surf perch, they likely migrate into the surf zone in the winter to feed on the larger sand crab species that are a little bit further offshore and in deeper waters during the winter. Um, and then that allows them to get nice and fat for when they finally give birth later in the year. And so that likely explains why um, there was an increase in invertebrate species or in these surf perch species during the winter. Um, for invertebrates though, you might have noticed that there was a pretty distinct lack of invertebrates at Whaler's Cove. And the reason for this was likely because of the profile of that beach. So most, the other three sites apart from Whaler's Cove were more like this figure on the left. And that as you gradually went further away from shore, it was just a nice steady decrease in the, or increase in the depth. And um, it just slowly got deeper. But then Whaler's Cove was more like it is shown here on the right where right after you get past the breaking waves at that beach, it was about a six foot drop. And then you were in uh, six to 10 feet of water just immediately off of shore. So uh, this really steep profile was probably not the most conducive to having um, a nice diverse invertebrate community. Um, but then interestingly too, I did uh, record some increases in the cancer day crabs during the winter. And so um, they've been pretty well documented to come into the surf zone during the winter to feed. And so species like the Dungeness crab and slender crab, um, I did notice more of them on the brubs in the winter, which was kind of cool. Um, also just to, to pull this figure back in from the fish assemblage, this is the result from the NMDS, uh, you'd see that the, um, the Spanish Bay and Carmel ellipses here, there's a lot of overlap between them. However, for the Whaler's Cove and Stillwater Cove ellipses, there's actually no overlap between them. Uh, so that probably points to these two sites maybe not being the best comparison for each other for the fish assemblage. Um, and this was likely just due to the differences in the coves. Um, so while they were both protected coves that had a minimum amount of wave action, uh, Whaler's Cove typically had more of like the traditional kelp forest species present. So things like the full kelp and the giant kelp were common at Whaler's Cove uh, while at Stillwater Cove. Um, it was more of the shallow water algae species like the seagrass and the red algae. So um, while they were both coves, they were kind of different and um, that might have been what was driving the differences between them. Um, so it was a really cool effect that uh, MPAs were impacting the fish assemblage. Um, here's just a list of all the species that associated with MPAs and references. Um, and another really cool factor of uh, the species that associated with MPAs was that a lot of them are commonly targeted recreational fish here in California. Um, so that was really cool to see that um, these species did kind of associate more strongly with marine protected areas here. Um, this kind of coincides with the results from our larger statewide assessment of marine protected areas on the surf zone, um, where we did find that both abundance represented as CPUE and richness of fish species uh, were significantly different at, uh, significantly greater at MPA sites than reference sites. Um, however, the results from this study showed that the, most of that difference was kind of from more of the southern sites, where in Southern California, there's a lot more uh, surf fishing and fishing from piers um, versus up here in Central California. It's not quite as heavily fished. Um, on about the 44 times that I went sampling, uh, probably on less than three of them did I actually observe somebody fishing in the surf zone here. Um, so my study also found some pretty interesting environmental trends, which didn't necessarily go in line with a lot of the previous literature on the surf zone. Um, so the water temperature, um, I found that the thornback ray and dwarf perch did associate positively with that, but there were quite a few species that associated negatively with that too. Um, while it's pretty unanimous in the literature that a lot of um, the surf species associate positively with warmer temperatures. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. But then wave height um, had a pretty mixed effect for me. There were a lot of species that associated negatively, but again, there were four or five species that did associate positively with wave height. Um, while 
traditionally, um, the bigger the waves, the fewer species there are. So that was kind of an interesting finding too. Um, and then the percent cover of algae um, has, again, been pretty, pretty well shown to be a positive association with surf, um, with surf zone species. So things like, um, in addition to providing the nutrients, uh, the kelp usually brings in a lot of invertebrates for things like the surf perch to eat and then provides that shelter. Um, however, for my study, I didn't notice any significant trends for uh, fish species and algae. And while there was some trends for invertebrates, um, some species preferred green algae. But again, there was that really interesting trend where um, nobody, none of the invertebrates uh, associated positively with the red algae. Um, however, it is also worth mentioning that um, my sampling days were pretty heavily selected to be the most calm days. Um, so <laughs> uh, here's just some wave height data from uh, NOAA weather buoy we have in Monterey Bay. And so I'm just showing the data from uh, December of 2020 through February of 2021, which coincides with my sampling window uh, for the winter. And these green dots represent the days that I sampled. Um, and so uh, you might notice that there's this pretty big window up here where we had a lot of larger wave events, and I did not sample during those. Um, so while I did start to, uh, while I did identify some trends in things like wave height, um, it's still pretty unknown how the surf zone might change for those much, much larger wave day events. Um, and if those species that did associate with the bigger waves would still be present on those really, really big wave days. So. That would be kind of interesting to look at in the future. Um, but speaking of two, uh, I do think that getting an additional, additional years of data would be very beneficial. Um, I only had one year of data, and during that year, it also happened to coincide with a minor La Nina, which is a big oceanographic um, change in conditions. And here in central California, that means colder waters. Um, and so, uh, you can see that here, again, this is just water temperature data represented in this plot here. Um, and so in April of 2020, the water temperature was 13 degrees Celsius, um, which is 54 degrees and Fahrenheit. And then in April of 2021, when I was sampling, uh, it was 11 and a half degrees on average. So it was, um, while it's only like a degree and a half or two degrees um, difference, that still could make a pretty big difference in which species are present. So. Um, and then additionally, like I mentioned earlier, the wildfires were happening. So in Monterey, we had the Carmel and River fires. Um, and then up in Santa Cruz, there was the CZU lightning fire. And so while none of these fires really got that close to my sampling sites, um, it has been documented that the wildfires uh, can increase the amount of erosion and then runoff, uh, which flows into the surf zone. So those factors could have been impacting the surf while I was sampling it too. Um, so again, getting multiple years of data would kind of help uh, minimize the effect of these larger, longer scale terms, trends. Um, and then I also think another really cool study in the future would be to kind of further dive into the, uh, the interaction of the invertebrates that I saw and the fish dynamics. So again, trying to kind of determine if those surf perch species were coming into the surf zone in the winter to feed on those um, sand crabs. Uh, it, this hasn't really been studied much because the surf zone is such a difficult area to study in. So I think uh, continuing to look at those interactions could shine a lot of light on the, the food web and the trophic dynamics of the surf zone. So just to summarize everything now, um, I did successfully use brubs to sample the surf zone throughout the year. And I did find seasonal trends for both fish and invertebrates. Um, MPAs did have an effect on fish species and wave height was the biggest driver for the surf species present. And so I'd just like to say a very huge thank you to everybody that assisted with this project. It was an absolutely massive undertaking, and I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it without so much help from so many people. Um, and then I'd also love to thank my committee members, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Kahn and Dr. Dugan were all phenomenal throughout this entire process and were more than helpful at every single step. Um, I'd like to thank my funding sources for the project. And again, I cannot thank the people that came out and helped me sample the surf zone enough times. Um, and then of course, I'd love to thank 
uh, everybody in my lab, but then also everyone in the Moss Landing community and all of the faculty and staff here we have at Moss for making this such an enjoyable and memorable experience. And with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a really big one. I know that that's been shown especially to correlate with uh, sand crabs, and sand crabs um, have had a really big interaction with the grain size. Um, I think that that was kind of shown at Whaler's Cove where there was, um, it started to get a little bit into the kelp forest, as you can kind of see from like having rockfish species present. Um, but I think if you did that at more of like the, the Spanish Bay and Carmel Beach, um, that would be pretty interesting because I do think that the community would continue to shift as you got further out. Um, I know that there's like the spiny sand crab or like the bigger sand crab. Um, occasionally you would see one of the carcasses from them like move through the camera. So I think as you started to get further out, you could potentially see them introduced into the mix along with other species of fish that would be out there. Yeah, maybe, uh, or maybe not change your results. <laughs> Um, I mean, it would, again, I think it would be a shift in the community, so it would potentially add a new species, and so that could potentially change the results. Um, depth was a significant factor for uh, the fish assemblage, but it, it was such a minor factor that it didn't really explain anything, so I think if you potentially increased and added in depth and sand grain size, those could have explained some additional variability. Really interesting. Um, I don't know how you can control for that small depth range in grain size, but it was really interesting. I'm glad to see that work done. Uh, great job, Ken. Uh, I was curious, so of your 52 grubs where you saw nothing, how many of those were that sort of like whitewash sandblasting type video where you showed us where there's you're not going to see anything even if it's there? And how do you think, does that have an impact on like if surf perch or rockfish are going to come into that area? Like if they can't see what they're hunting, are they going to move into the surf zone? Are they going to stay deeper? How would that sort of trade off? Uh, ignorance of fish behavior, so I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that is fair. Interestingly, even on those very poor visibility days, you'd be pretty surprised what you'd see. Uh, the surf perch would usually just swim into the camera. So. Um, Again, I, I, you do probably lose a lot, especially with a limited depth of field. You can't see quite everything that's there. Um, but I don't think all 52 of those days coincided with um, being super poor visibility. Um, but that is a reason that I added the visibility of the BRUV into the distance-based redundancy analysis to try to see if that was a factor. And it was for both of them. Um, so again, I think species like the speckled sand dab were probably still present in the surf, but I couldn't really see them on days when the visibility was about a foot. Um, and same with the sand crabs and the purple dwarf olive snail. Like they're very um, bottom heavy, like they sit in the sediment and you can't really see them swimming around. So if you're not able to see the sediment around the brub, then you're probably missing what's actually there. I'm curious, kind of building up what he was saying with your water visibility, if um, like algal cover was something that kind of factored into your ability to like see species. I know in like still water code, you get some really thick algal areas, whether that's something you accounted for. Yeah, no, that just kind of went into visibility. It was just kind of a measure of how much of it you could see, and if there was algae blocking it, like that still 
would decrease the visibility. Do you know, or did you say, the um, amount of grub, um, <coughs> like hour long you know, samples that uh, were, were less than that meter uh, visibility? What the proportion of the, was it like a small portion of them that had lower visibility? Mm, I think so. I mean, I, again, I think visibility averaged, I don't remember the exact value, but it, it averaged to be pretty consistent for every season and every year. It wasn't like in the winter I only had like one foot visibility. It was, it was still pretty mixed throughout the whole year. Uh, great talk. Um, I'm also ignorant of fish behavior, <laughs> but does the presence of a bait bag like affect like the sample sampling bias? Or anything like that, to like, or even the, the absence. Yeah. So I mean, that, yes, bait bags have been shown to alter the behavior of fish, and that was actually something really cool that they were observing in Southern California for their portion of the project, where they would have like a kelp bass or a cabazon just sit on the bait bag and then guard the bait bag and like scare off other fish. Um, that wasn't really something I identified here. Um, that I never really observed that happening. The Interestingly, the surf perch didn't care about the bait. That was more for like species like, uh, like these smooth hound sharks that were interested in the bait or the leopard sharks. Um, so I think the reason that we ultimately decided to use the bait instead of no bait was to kind of bring things into the area a little bit to better sample the surf because it is such a turbulent environment. It's not like it's um, like you're sampling in the middle of the ocean and trying to to look for like oceanic white tips or something. So adding in bait is going to significantly alter their their location and their behavior versus in the surf zone. It's what's there is there. You're just trying to make sure that you record it. Thank you. Um, again, you noticed a surprising effect of, um, of temperature. Right? Um, and I was wondering if the other studies you were comparing to were those upwelling systems as well or other types of systems where maybe temperature might not be correlated with productivity as much? Yeah, I think most, so again, a lot of the, the studies haven't really occurred in California where we have the upwelling. Um, I know that there have, they have done some stuff in South Africa, but that's more looking at the effects of marine protected areas. Um, I think the, the results, or the other studies looking at temperature, um, we're looking at, that one took place in the Northern Atlantic Ocean um, so still a little bit of the temperate, but I don't think they quite have the same amount of upwelling that we get here. Yeah, and did those other studies that we had temperature, did they, I mean, were they looking more spatially, or did they also look, you know, seasonally at the temperature? Because you might have a different prediction if you're looking like along the coast, high temperature might be adversity versus in one place mm -hmm. within a season. I think it was more spatially. So that, that is a really good point too, is that those are two very different things on yeah, the, the temperature gradient by latitude or the temperature gradient at one place throughout the year changes, so. Maybe that's why you guys sort of a different pattern than those others, because some very few people who are looking at these seasonal changes. Yeah. Um, cool results. Um, what was the reasoning behind putting seagrass into its own algae classification? Um, I just chose to do that because uh, it is, it was a little different. Like the green seagrass is the ulva and that um, is really more of an intertidal species or yeah, like a, a tide pool species. So um, just because of the difference and because it's more, it has like the the bigger volume because it grows out and wavy versus ulva kind of keeps a little bit closer. That was just kind of why I chose to do those. Do you have any questions in the, in the chat at all on the Zoom there? Yeah. Uh, Read it out. Mr. <laughs> Kaye. <laughs> um, he said, good job on the difficult subject, tough to track trophic interactions, any way to do such a thing in the future. And he also asked if bait had any difference, um, made any difference when uh, employing the brub. Um, so I think first starting with the trophic interactions, that is, there's probably a reason it hasn't been answered and that's because it is such a difficult uh, study. Uh, my 
third committee member, Dr. Dugan at UC Santa Barbara did her dissertation for her PhD on uh, sand crab. And so she was actually kind of the one that, that mentioned that, like that's a really cool factor that you found, um, you like have video documentation of these potentially larger sand crabs in the winter when like she's studied a lot of sand crabs and kind of predicted that that was the case, but it's, it's hard enough to study sand crabs in the swash zone and where the waves are um, as we know from class here, it's, that's pretty difficult to do. So going out into the ocean and then trying to sample sand crabs in like five, six feet of water um, would probably require some very specialized equipment and a lot more work. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think continuing to, to get those multi-year, um, those additional years of data and just mainly confirming if these trends are true or if I just happened to be sampling on days when the surf perch were more abundant in the surf zone in the winter um, versus if they were actually there. Um, so again, I think sampling during more days and more years could potentially either add in new results or kind of re, uh, re solidify the current results that I have. Anything else in the chat? Or? No, those are all the chat questions. One more. Do we know like the home range of a surf perch? Like does one individual stay in a really small area or are they migrating? Yeah, they're pretty localized. Um, there's a study done on uh, red tail surf perch up in Northern California and they did a mark and recapture study and found that they, they could move hundreds of miles along the coast but generally they were within like a little like 10 mile range. Like you would catch the same one at the same beach type stuff, so. Um, do you think there would be any way to do this study at night? Or <laughs> <laughs> because like generally, like, at least in seagrass, right? Things are more active at night. And, you know, things kind of hunker down in the daytime. And so, like, would it be, do you think it would be even possible to yeah. do anything like this at night? I mean, they have, you can use infrared cameras and infrared lights that um, species can't really see. So you, they do, you can do brubs at night. That's um, one way that they look at stuff in the deep sea too. Um, if you would want to do it in the night while swimming around in the waves and you can't see that, that raises a different question. But, but that is a good point is that um, another study did, they seined both throughout the day, a little bit into the night and then on different tides and found that um, tide was a pretty influential factor, but so they found more species, I think, at dusk and dawn um, than just like in the middle of the day. So that was kind of interesting too. Along similar lines, uh, what, what do you think, or what does people in the field kind of think the future of trying to do a study like this, but include those really high wave zone times or, or times of the day, uh, but safely without saying to swim around there, right? Like, what, what do you think? Will we be able to do that soon, or what? What? How much is that too expensive and realistic? Um, I mean, that's that's a fun question to think about. Like, if it was just designing a more permanent structure that you could put there and then leaving a camera that could withstand constant big waves and then just kind of seeing that. Um, that It gets a little tough with the tide because the tide kind of changes the depth of the beach so much. So it'd be kind of hard to set up like a permanent situation. Um, the GoPro cameras didn't really last more than an hour and a half. I don't know if, if it would be better if you could like take a time lapse instead of video and then leave it out for a couple of days. Um, but then of course you always risk like losing the equipment or having it be buried, which happened a few times, even after an hour, the waves would be strong enough to just bury an entire brub. So it's, it's a tough one. <laughs> Engineering problem. All right, Kinsey, you want to do the last question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, do you have a favorite like memory of going out and sampling <laughs> 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 What was the best day? Um, there were some really beautiful days at Carmel. Carmel was kind of my, my favorite site because one, it's a dog beach, so that was always fun to play with the dogs while the brubs were 
collecting. Um, and then two, sometimes the conditions at Carmel especially would just be like super clear and you'd just be able to see so much and like it was almost a little bit like Hawaii where you just have like these really beautiful waves and nice clear conditions and then the water's just like 50 degrees. And <laughs> Right. You are done. <laughs>